<clears throat> okay, everybody. If ever there was a time to give a lecture on global health, it seems like this is the one since we're living through such an amazing event. And it's interesting because these are slides I've used for years to try to make a talk on global health seem more relevant to audiences who, like me, are always so focused with whatever we're dealing with at that point in time here and our little lives around usually the United States that it's taken a little effort in recent years and all the years I've taught to make global health sort of resonate with, uh, with anybody because it just seems so distant. People you'll never know, conditions you'll never see, places you'll never visit. So what? Why should we care about other people's health really? And these are the old slides I always use. Uh, I, I kind of broke it down into three basic reasons. You can have all three be ones that uh, persuade you to be interested in global health or just one of them. But you know, one of the ones that a lot of people who work in global health are motivated by are, are ethical or moral reasons. And um, you know, they, they work in global health because they have a skill set and it's needed in places that those, those skills aren't available. And it makes them feel good and it makes them feel like they're behaving in a way that their conscience feels good. And they, they like to push back on some of the world's injustices and inequalities and unfairness. They'll, they won't solve it, but as human beings, who, and we do things for mostly emotional reasons and then we rationalize later. For a lot of people, working in global health is part of how they, as responsible human beings, try to push back on this unfairness. This is our younger son, Ben, who I won't elaborate, but this is a clinic in Cusco, Peru, many years ago. And some of those patients around him are his fellow classmates who were sick. And then about a month later, Ben came down with a, with a scarlet fever that was kind of scary. But even though it was scary, I always remember that as a professor from the United States, I had a, a, an insurance card that would evacuate him if his condition never got you know, really concerning, which it didn't. And it made me think that that's a privilege that most people in the clinic and most people in developing countries don't have. And even though I'm not a clinician, I could sense what it's like to have something that other people don't have that you wish everybody would have because they're human beings no less than you and me. I just happened to win the birth lottery and got lucky. So I have access to all these privileges that I didn't earn. I don't merit, but I have, and they're great in, in healthcare and you, you value having them in these situations. So one of the main reasons people work in global health and people are drawn to global health and people love global health is, is because of ethical and moral reasons and the opportunity to, to address classic universal timeless inequalities and unfairnesses. A second reason that has nothing to do with ethics or morality is just pure finances and money and economics it has to do with free trade. And I use this example when I graduated um, from college in 1990, tuition was quite low, but the computer I bought that year with a student discount, a very deluxe at the time, Apple desktop computer with a dot matrix printer and a green screen cost $5,000. And today, the tuition where I teach um, has gone up significantly, but laptop prices, electronics, clothing prices have gone down substantially. Why is that? Because computers and clothes and other things are made where labor is cheaper through free trade. But things that can't be, uh, can't be bought and manufactured elsewhere have gone up a lot in cost, like healthcare and education. So to my finance friends, my economic friends who who care about dollars and cents and how things make sense economically, you care about global health because the more countries that we can trade with that have a minimum level of public health, the more free trade works to our benefit and to other countries' benefit. And yet, you have to have a minimum level of public health in a country to be a trading partner. Those countries like Venezuela, Sudan, um, places, Haiti, that are really, really struggling with just minimum levels of public health can't really leverage the power of free trade because companies won't locate their manufacturing in those countries. They want, they want middle-income countries that have a minimum level of public health to put their, their, their manufacturing plants to, in the Dominican Republic, in China, in Vietnam, in Bangladesh, in the Philippines, in Peru in Nicaragua, they need to have a country that has a minimum level of public health to staff their factories and have a stable condition. So the finance people, the business school people, they care about public health because they care about free trade.
And then this is always the kicker slide I've always given, which is, hey, in the end, who cares about themselves? Who doesn't want to die? I don't. And, you know, I'd have this cute slide of things, of ways you don't get swine flu, but swine flu is like the last big thing we dealt with. And the reason why we all care about global health is we all care about ourselves. And diseases that are in one part of the world are now, at any point in time, only 36 hours away from where we live by air travel. And now this has all been made so easy for me to lecture on because here we are, and I'm, I'm taping this lecture and I'm making it available to students who I can't see in person, and I don't know when I'm going to see them again, because we have canceled classes, and the campuses are ghost towns. They're out of a movie. They're dystopian, and students are at home um, trying to learn as best they can in situations that they didn't anticipate, and missing college far more than they probably ever thought they would. They missed the library so much. So I don't need to make a big argument anymore. COVID-19 makes the argument for me why we all need to care about global health. And these are students, pictures of students saying, hey, I am tired of learning on Zoom and online. I want to learn in person and I want some of my tuition back. A more um, eloquent way of stating this was done by Joshua Lederberg who won the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 1958 when he said, no matter how selfish our motives, we cannot be indifferent to the suffering of others. The microbe that felled one child in a distant continent yesterday can reach yours today and see the global pandemic tomorrow. I've read that thing so many times and thought, I know that's true, but I can't think of recent examples to drive home this point, but now I can. How can we procrastinate any further or have any reservations about a common cause? One that responds to every outbreak of disease anywhere as a challenge to all of us. And again, this kind of always sounded like cheerleading for so many years. We are living this reality in a very painful, immediate way. And which is why you have these more and more episodes of all these documentary series explaining basic epidemiology and contact tracing and virus transmissions and vectors. And I have to say, as someone who's been teaching public health and healthcare policy for most of my adult life, this is a terrible thing we're living through, but it's, it means that it's actually, the stuff that I've been teaching is real. This stuff happens. It's happened throughout history. And just because we're modern people, we think it doesn't happen anymore. It does very clearly phenomenal series, which I had assigned part of for class that uh, came out, I think, in November, the fall of 2019. And even then, it kind of seemed like, oh, boy, another great documentary about something that could happen, but it hasn't happened. And now it's happened. And uh, it, one of the episodes profile is a, a family of anti-vaxxers who um, I wonder if all the anti-vaxxers in the world now will have some second thoughts when we do come up with a COVID-19 vaccine about the value of getting this. Maybe not, maybe they'll, they'll, they'll remain steadfast in their opposition to vaccines, but I, I, you haven't heard as much from them in the last month and a half. And it's ironic in this documentary, you go from a, a fairly affluent family of, of anti-vaxxers, non-vaccine families to the border and clinics that are run for uh, refugees seeking asylum and, re and immigration to the United States. They can't get enough flu vaccine. They're always desperately trying to get as many vaccines as they can to give to children and adults coming across the border. And this is a great segment in that Netflix pandemic series showing that these children who died in the child detention centers died of influenza. And that's why they're so desperate to get the influenza vaccine, the flu vaccine down there, because flu can kill. And the children who have died in detention um, died of influenza. Another interesting story from a, the, a previous decade, Andrew Speaker was an attorney in Atlanta who, uh, we don't know how he developed it, but he contracted um, uh, multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. And then against the CDC's wishes, he flew with his fiance to uh, the Mediterranean to get married. Honeymoon came back. And then upon returning, he was in a sense apprehended and then put in quarantine. And then they had to go back and trace all the people that had shared a flight with Mr. Speaker, because they'd all been exposed to a very serious respiratory disease. I've given this slide so many times and people have thought, wow, that's crazy. Crazy. I'm just glad that doesn't happen. We don't have to do that anymore. And now this is, is this has been updated to, uh, to COVID-19. And I also put this in here to note that tuberculosis can sound like a historical disease, the Victorian era, ancient part of human history. Thank goodness we don't have to deal with TB anymore we still are dealing with TB. And this is 
just because it's not in our backyard doesn't mean it's not in a lot of people's backyards. And tuberculosis kills more people than any other pathogenic illness. Um, these are the places where it's still profoundly prevalent. And every year, approximately, give or take, 1.5 million people die from tuberculosis. So it is not gone at all. And in some places where they have high HIV rates, like South Africa, it's a tandem comorbid killer. The HIV AIDS in tandem with tuberculosis is why death rates there are much higher. India has roughly 10 to 11 million cases at any one time and about 2 million to 3 million new cases every year. Vietnam is a hot spot for um, tuberculosis and tuberculosis, like any respiratory disease, can hit anybody. Young people, old people, active people, healthy people, sick people, it's respiratory. You can't really get away from it. And Peru, where I've had uh, the opportunity to shadow and work with some clinicians, multi-drug resistant tuberculosis is a problem. Tuberculosis is a problem. And getting treatment to people who are in remote places is a real challenge because they can't just come into city clinics. They're day workers in rural areas. That's how they make their living. You have to find ways to take the treatment to them. And that's always the challenge in global health. The real challenge in global health is not getting new drugs and new medicines and new surgeries. Apart from a, a vaccine for COVID-19, we don't need really anything new at all. What we need is to get what we have in abundance here to where it's needed most around the world. That's the real challenge of global health. It's not cutting edge new science fiction drugs and discoveries. It's just getting what we already have to places where it's needed the most. This is a really important graph. It, it shows on the x-axis how easily, how easily spread is a disease? Is this, does it spread from person to person really easy like measles does, rotavirus, whooping cough? These are super infectious diseases. It's very easy to pass from one person to the next. And then you measure that against the, the y-axis that says what percentage of the people that get this disease die? In other words, how lethal and dangerous is that disease? And rabies is a classic example. If measles and malaria and whooping cough are the easiest to spread, rabies, rabies is the most lethal. It kills 100% of the people that get it if it's untreated. It's 100% lethal. Thankfully, it's very hard to spread because it's, there's very few ways you can get rabies. The most dangerous diseases are the ones that are out here in the middle that are, that are fairly easy to spread and fairly lethal. And so tuberculosis, polio, smallpox, diphtheria, these are the scariest ones because even though they're not 100% lethal or the easiest to spread, they're in the middle. A lot of people get these diseases and they can kill a lot of people. And probably historically, tuberculosis has been the worst disease of all time because it spreads pretty easily and it kills most of the people who get it if they don't, if they don't get treated for it. Now, I go back to this other one we highlighted here, smallpox. Not as lethal as tuberculosis, but, um, but still a very horrible disease. That, we don't really know much about anymore apart from those who are into medical history because in 1979, 1980, smallpox was essentially eradicated from the planet by virtue of extensive vaccination. There's two, I think, samples left that we keep in very safe quarters in case we ever need to come up with a vaccine again. Guinea worm will, will probably be disease number two that will be eradicated from the planet in the next 10 years. It's on, I think there were maybe like less than 20 cases last year where for all of human history, there were millions of cases of this very, very excruciatingly painful parasitic infection. Polio is within the next year or two. I mean, maybe even 2020 was the most recent prediction. It might take a few more years to get the very last couple of cases, but we're down to less than 30 cases of polio. Again, for all of human history, a terrible disease. Malaria, maybe not in my lifetime, but in my students' lifetime, I think uh, malaria might be eradicated or very close to eradication. Um, a, 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 a perennial killer and disabler and uh, major cause of suffering in these uh, tropical regions of the world. Good news on malaria even is that the deaths from malaria have fallen in half over the last, in this last generation, the last two decades. Now, when you get to the very end of eradicating any disease, the costs go up so much because the, the last reservoirs are the hardest to get to. But again, thankfully, malaria will be like the fourth disease that's eradicated. So I, I put this in here to, to note for all those listening. I know we live in some really disturbing times with um, diseases and just bad news. But if you actually look at overall the trajectory of, of health statistics and life expectancy and medications, there's never been a better time to live. And if you just look at the overall arc and trajectory and where we stand now versus where we've ever been in terms of healthcare, 
and life expectancy and medications and everything, we're the best we've ever been. And so that often gets lost when we're dealing with the crisis of the moment. But in all these indicators that we've, the women who die in childbirth has been halved. Uh, malaria deaths significantly down. HIV is no longer a killer as long as you get treatment for it. Now it's a chronic disease. Increased life expectancy in every country. Decreased child mortality in every country. Now, before we get too excited and think, okay, we're, you know, we're good, we're going to continue to see new diseases just like COVID-19. And we're seeing more and more, even though we have better tools to fight them. And there are four main reasons. There's actually a fifth one that we'll add on at the end. The four reasons why we, we continue to see uh, infectious diseases and new ones is that we have more and more travel. Air travel has come down as a cost. It's more affordable to fly to more places in the world. And so more of us do it more of the time. And that's great. But more travel means diseases can get from one part of the planet to other parts so much more quickly than they can, they have in all of human history. Reason number one. Reason number two, in 2015, we finally crossed like this, we crossed this Rubicon where the, over 50% of the Earth's population lived in urban areas. It's always been less than 50%, more people were in rural areas. But in 2015, we kind of crossed the streams and now it's 50% plus live in urban areas and it will never go back because there's just more economic opportunities in urban areas. And that's good. The downside is it's really easy to spread cholera, tuberculosis, COVID-19 here than it is in very rural, minimally populated areas. The more densely populated a place is, the more easy and more, the more rapid the disease can spread from person to person. And we're seeing that with COVID-19 too. The places that are the most densely populated are the places we're seeing the most disease transmission. And these places that are densely populated also hold large sections of poverty. You mix those two together and you can also spread disease very quickly. And global warming, climate change and global warming um, allow for more and more parts of the earth to be very hospitable and comfortable for mosquitoes. Um, and anything that a mosquito can spread uh, that's that's a disease can be spread more if there are more places that mosquitoes can be and the warmer the planet gets the more the mosquito is happy the last reason the fifth reason i would highlight that's really come to light in the covid19 uh, crisis is the increased human consumption of animal proteins of meat and as people as wealth increases and poverty decreases as more people become wealthier and less poor they want to eat more meat that's just a natural trend um, but the more we interact with animals for meat supply, the more we expose ourselves to animals, viruses that have otherwise stayed within the animal populations. And the NIPA virus is an example. COVID-19 has an animal origin. Uh, the Spanish influenza, influenza 1918 had an animal origin. Most of the, these big diseases that are so dangerous to us, they're dangerous because they're new to us, and to, they're new to our bodies, but they're old diseases that have tended to stay in animal circles. And when these viruses jump the species barrier from animal, bats, pigs, um, uh, ducks, um, avian uh, animals, when they jump to us, we have no exposure, no built up immunity, no familiarity with our immune systems to these, and they can be so dangerous. And bats really get a bad rap and deservedly so. Unfortunately, it sounds so weird to be anti any one particular animal, but bats are really, really good reservoirs for really bad diseases. And these are just the different levels of how a disease gets categorized. An endemic is a health condition that occurs at a steady rate among a population, right? It's, it's, it's predictable and it's local. If it gets bigger, it's called an outbreak, a condition that occurs above the endemic level. And then if it spills out and above that, the outbreak level then becomes an epidemic, an outbreak that has spread to a larger geographic area. And then if it goes global, it's a pandemic, which is what we're experiencing now. Historically, there have been all kinds of huge pandemics. Um, and I hope we're not on the verge of one of this size. Um, I would say probably unlikely, unless we can't get it under control, will not be as bad as the 1918 flu. Um, these are not proportional to the population. So 50 million in 1918 would be significantly larger in today's larger population. Uh, here's the biggest of all, Black Death in the Middle Ages, that essentially wiped out a third of Europe. But this is, you know, th these have been around and we kind of think, oh, this is history. This can never happen again. It's just so historical. It's so pre the modern era of medicine. Clearly not true. 
And now we're learning the hard way in a way that and it's not Professor Mays or any other professor or teacher teaching something historical. We're living this lesson. And this, this COVID-19 began in China in November, December 2019. And then within three or four months, we are now, everything's canceled and we're at home. That's how fast things spread. You want to have a textbook, textbook example of what international travel can do to any pathogen, a microbe, is that something that started here in the late winter is now paused all of our daily living and put people on lockdown and led to conditions that we've only learned about in history books. And the COVID-19 is, is much more lethal than the, the, the seasonal flu, in part because the seasonal flu always has genetic material with which our bodies are familiar with. We've seen flu all of our existence. And even though it mutates a little bit every year, when our body gets exposed to it, we've seen it before. We have some built up um, antibodies and antigens to fight it. And we also have a vaccine that we develop every year that's about 50% effective in most years for most mutations of the flu. So does the flu kill a lot of people? It does, but it's manageable and it doesn't pose a huge risk to all of us. COVID-19, no one's ever been exposed to. We have zero acquired inherited immunity and we don't have a vaccine for it yet, which is why we're in, we're in uncharted territory. And we have certain professions that are uniquely um, exposed to this disease, and they tend to be clinicians and flight attendants and people who are interacting with people up very close. Now, this is a curve that would have been so theoretical, I would have had to explain. In fact, I didn't even, I never had this. I've never had a flattening the curve graph in my global health lecture because I've never really had to explain this because we haven't lived through one anytime in recent memory. But now, this is going to be probably the image of 2020. Um, this is the health system capacity. This is how many ICU beds you have. This is how many ventilators you have. And this is how many doctors, nurses, and other allied health professionals that can manage COVID-19 cases. And then if you don't do anything, this is what the spike was going to be because the disease was spreading so quickly. We would have very, very quickly overwhelmed the health system capacity. And you would have had crisis and pandemonium and scenes out of a movie if we didn't shut everything down send everybody home cancel all events close all operations so that we could slow this uptake and now we're living in this sort of more gradual incline and the goal is as much as humanly possible everywhere to stay below this health system capacity and and this is important because this is not a fixed position this line can go down if more doctors and nurses get sick and we overwhelm the number of ventilators we have, then this line can go down as the number of cases go up. So we are doing everything we can to stay below this and then to reinforce the resources that constitute where this line exists. And in the meantime, we're trying to build up tests to see who has it. We're trying to build new ventilators. We're trying to create more masks for more people to wear more of the time to stay below this manageable level. Now, the downside of that is underneath this line is the, the depth of the recession we're going to induce by taking longer to get through this, this, this curve. Um, and this is the graph that led a lot of people to cancel classes and send people home. This came out um, in London in middle of March, they created this graph that was based on what had happened in Italy and China. And they said, this is what, this is the capacity. This is the trajectory we're on if you don't do something. So we all panicked, rightfully so, to slow this down. But that also means the better job we do now in keeping people away from being exposed to this disease, well, eventually we're going to have to come out of our houses and go back to some some semblance of a life. But in so doing, all of us who have been so hunkered down the way we should be, we haven't been exposed to the disease. We don't have a vaccine yet and won't have one for another 18 to 24 months. That means that it's likely we're going to have another spike or two or three. When as we release our quarantines and allow people to go back, well, they're going to go back to being in places where they're going to be exposed to this disease, so there'll be another uptick and another uptick. Now, hopefully, every uptick thereafter gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and all of them stay underneath our capacity to manage these cases, but it's not a one-and-done thing. The better we do now to avoid this calamity, the more likely it is that we're going to have other waves, smaller ones thereafter. And if we have another one in the fall, you know, this impacts schools, colleges, daily operations in a very significant way. 
These are graphs that we're all becoming more and more familiar with. This is the curve that we're trying to flatten out. This is the number of deaths, number of cases, and this is the map of every place that it has that's that it that this virus has gone to. And pretty much every country has at least one or two cases. In some places, of course, here we have the most. How does COVID, how do COVID-9 deaths compare to other deaths from leading causes? Well, it's not as big as heart disease and cancer, but we have a whole health system that can manage this quantity. We don't have a health system that is able to handle this much without sending everybody home, which, you know, and it, it doesn't really necessarily make sense to build a health system around this happening every year because it doesn't happen every year. So we don't build a system around this. We build a system around this. But when this comes in, we don't really have a way to handle it except for chasing the vaccine and then hunkering down. Now, these statistics we have on the number of deaths are all estimates. What we're not capturing is when people die at home, they don't necessarily get categorized as a COVID-19 death. So whatever the COVID death 19 tallies are, it's, it's almost, it's very, very likely that it's an undercount. In the middle of a lecture, I get to show you how to sneeze properly into your elbow. The number of cardiac arrest deaths has spiked in New York at the same time that these COVID-19 cases are spiking. So the likelihood is that a lot of things that are not being categorized as COVID-19 deaths, but their deaths are probably something that are very associated with COVID-19 in one way, shape, or form. You can end up dying of a heart attack that was triggered underlying that by a COVID-19 case. So our death rate's probably higher. Now that's the public health epidemiology side. The flips, the bottom part of that, of that um, curve that we're flattening, there's another curve, which is economic activity. And I've never seen a graph like this. The number of um, unemployment claims. I mean, look at this. Even back in, a decade ago, we had a very, very bad recession. We had, it's called the Great Recession because if we hadn't done more interventions, it would have been another depression. And it was bad. I mean, it was like 10, eight to 10 million people lost their job. It was tough. And we spent the last decade rebuilding all the jobs we lost in that last recession. And then in one month, all wiped out. It took a whole decade of pretty good economic activity, especially in the last couple of years, to, to, re, to recreate all the jobs we lost in the last recession. And then in one month, we lost them all again. You want to see the power of disease. You want to see the power of of epidemiology and public health. You just see what, what disease can do to your economy and what a disease can do to clinicians on the front lines who, who have to make some of the most intense decisions of all time. You have 50 patients, you've got 30 ventilators. Who, who do you, how do you give them? To whom? Under what conditions? Do you give them to the youngest because they, the, they have the most life left to live? Do you give it to the sickest? Uh, do you give it to the people who are reasonably sick and have the best chance of surviving? Because if you give it to the very sickest, you might be wasting it because they're not going to survive. Only a minority of people that go on to a ventilator survive, which is not known to everybody. But thank God we have them because there are so many stories of people who have been on ventilators and then survived and lived, and that's awesome. But technically, it's like 30 40%. Might, in some cases, even less, it's 20%. The scary thing about ventilators is that by the time you're on them, most people never get off and you die. Should we give uh, ventilators to those who have the greatest likelihood of surviving? Should we do what we do mostly in medicine, first come, first serve? And th but if you do that and then you don't save any for the crush that comes later, then you don't have them for people who come in who really need them, who are really acute. Um, do you give them to, to women who are pregnant because they, it's two lives you're dealing with? Do you give them, I, I didn't even list this in the list. Do you give it to people who can pay the most? Well, I think most of us would say no. But don't be surprised if that's going to happen. Rich people have means that we don't have. And if they want to live, they will find ways to circumvent first come, first serve, age. They'll, they'll buy their way into survival. One of the last considerations for rationing and limiting ventilators is maybe to give them to those who are most important to society. And what do I mean by most important to society? What I mean is, nurses, doctors, clinicians on the front lines of treating people. Um, if it's between me and a nurse who's working in the ICU, the ICU nurse is more important than me because they can treat other patients. I can't treat anybody. So it might make sense to give it to clinicians. Let me give you just a little glimpse of what this is like. It is 
is 18:22, April 2nd, on the road, driving to NYC. ICU nurses Jamie Eatons and Ryan Ward on a whirlwind road trip from their home in Oklahoma to New York City after responding to an online posting for crisis travel nurses. They're the arches. Yeah. Passing up St. Louis, we're what, six hours into the drive. I feel like it's our responsibility to step up and do what we've been trained to do and what we've known and felt like was our calling to do. Jamie and Ryan, part of a growing wave, nurses by the hundreds, who will work 12-hour shifts for 21 straight days. They're helping hands desperately needed in New York City, but they're more dead from COVID-19 than from the 9-11 terror attacks. I am asking healthcare professionals across the country, if you don't have a healthcare crisis in your community, please come help us in New York now. We need relief. Governor Cuomo temporarily suspending New York State license requirements, paving the way for licensed doctors and nurses from around the country to respond to that SOS. I'm from Alabama. I'm currently in New York City helping with the COVID-19 crisis. I went through the nurses that flew in from Atlanta to New York to help fight the crisis. Staffing agencies financially incentivize this work, paying so-called crisis rates that are typically much higher than regular rates, ranging from about $4,000 to as much as $10,000 per week. That financial incentive, I think, is obviously a big part of what got us here initially. But over the course of this trip and getting here, um, we've seen in ourselves kind of a, a, a spiritual uh, shift, if you will. This isn't going to end in New York. This is going to be in our backyard at home and I would hope that some nurses would take a step away from their families for a second and come help us if we needed it. The couple learns they'll both be on the overnight shifts and working in intensive care units but they'll be separated. Ryan assigned to a hospital in Manhattan, Jamie to one in Brooklyn. Leaving to our respective units and hospitals ready to get to work. A lot of anticipation. I have an idea what we're going into, but we should really know here shortly. A few days into their work, reality starts to sink in. It is bad. Uh, they are absolutely overloaded. Um, patients are incredibly sick. Everyone's vented. Everybody's COVID. Um, it's all the things that you would absolutely expect. Um, the nurses, they're, they're overworked. Having, overworked. They're having a hard time, and they've been doing this for weeks. We can't build a nurse, we can't build a doctor out of thin air, so you have to get them here. Critical care nurse Luke Adams drove from Pennsylvania to Staten Island last month, committing to a 13-week deployment. Reality start to set in, it's like day six. To save money, he slept on this baby mattress in the back of his rental SUV for more than a week. It's not supposed to be as cold tonight, which is good. After two days of onboarding at the hospital, Luke hit the ground running. I'm helping them manage the 16 patients. It's a lot. It's a lot more than, obviously, I'm used to. Back in the old world, what was the right. average load like? You are usually a two-to-one ratio. So having 16 of those critically ill patients on ventilators and being responsible for all the medications that they're getting. Two-to-one is one thing, but 16-to-one sounds impossible i would have agreed with you until i started doing it it's not just me you know there are other nurses that are there but through all the chaos and despair luke finds great solace in all the victories two people that i took care of on my first day over two weeks ago now they had already been there when i got there and yesterday as i was leaving the hospital there they were still in the same rooms but now they're off the ventilator the success stories are starting to happen i cannot begin to describe how much that makes a difference because for two straight weeks it felt like we were losing. I showered and I'm getting ready for bed. He's even in a hotel uh, now after the city well, found him free housing. It feels good to bed. It's, in it's encouraging to see. It's encouraging to see that we do have some things at our disposal that we're not totally at the mercy of this disease and we have an extraordinary clinical workforce that is semi-mobile that can go to places that are not tests um but we'll have to see if that's enough nationwide if you want to read a good book this summer a really good book um, i say one of the best 
on uh, infectious disease and epidemiology and where pandemics come from and is uh, David Quammen's spillover. And one of the famous takeaways from his book is that uh, these diseases, these new ones that come, remind us of the old Darwinian truth, the darkest of his truths, well known and persistently forgotten, that humanity is a kind of animal. Inextricably, inextricably connected with other animals in origin and in descent and in sickness and in health. Which leads to this next point about COVID-19 and other diseases that we've faced in the last couple decades. Whenever they come, we're always like, oh my God, where did this come from? This, this horrible accident, this natural disaster. More often than not, it's, it's not. The origins of this are in the ways that we treat and harvest and industrialize our meat supply and how we basically treat animals. And this is a, a really good reminder that we're going through right now that if we abuse animals and we invade their territories um, for meat supply and we don't treat them humanely, the viruses that stay in those sectors can spill over into and cross species. And you know this, this pandemic that we're dealing with has an, an animal origin and you know, we think it's in one of the, it might be in one of the meat markets or somewhere in China or having to do with bats, but how we treat animals can rebound on us in ways that we don't anticipate that are, that are profoundly serious. At this point in the lecture, I would normally show you um, one of the, you know, just a really cool example of public health um, that we got briefly exposed to a semester at sea in Myanmar. Um, and it, it's an example that you know, public health is, it's diseases, it's surgery, it's vaccines. It's also things like eyesight. And this is a great story if you wanna click on it, um, about one of the countries that this organization works to remove cataracts and restore sight. But eyeglasses, eyesight, cataract removals are a huge, huge way to improve people's health and mobility and ability to thrive. And yet eyesight's glasses, cataracts often think, oh, that can't be that big of a deal. Click on this and you'll see how big of a deal it is. Okay, towards the latter part of this lecture, and I'm gonna to begin to wrap up. If you wanna see what, what constitutes global health, it is, if you wanna break it down into five basic categories, and I made this illustration to show that if you live in a place that has access to all of these five major categories, or components to public health, then, then the expectation is you're gonna to live to 80, 85, possibly even 90 and above. If you live in a place where everybody has access to all the existing vaccines and immunizations, if you have daily access to healthy food and clean water and sanitation, stuff we always take for granted, if there's an emergency room nearby that you can take those once a year trauma cares or once a decade traumas, if you have basic economic opportunities and you always have access to antibiotics and family planning resources to control fertility, you have all of that, then you live 80 to 85 years. Places that have that wealthy, developed, industrialized, affluent countries, life expectancy is 80 because they have all of those components of public health. As you move down this income gradient to poorer and less affluent and very poor countries, you, you tend to have more places in these countries that don't have access to all five sides of that public health diamond. They, have, they don't have access to clean water all the time. They don't always have access to good healthy food. Sometimes family planning is not available at all. Sometimes vaccines aren't available. And as you work down this income gradient, each side of that diamond is worth about seven years of life expectancy. So if you lose, if you get it down to places that have that do not have consistent access to all five, you're losing 30 years of life expectancy. And that's, that's somewhat interesting. What's most interesting in this graph are those countries that outperform, overperform their level of wealth. So Costa Rica, Iran, China, Vietnam, Nicaragua, these are places that invest a lot. Morocco, they invest, now that's not true anymore of Syria given their war. But these are places that get better results, Bangladesh, outperforms its income significantly. And then there's places that under, the United States should be having higher life expectancy for all the wealth that we have. But for all the reasons we've covered in this class, we underperform our wealth. Japan overperforms. And this graph shows you that if you invest more wisely, whatever your resources are, you can get some really good results in life expectancy. And, and conversely, you can have lower child deaths. It's it all, where you, if you're north of this line or south of this line is a function of what you get for what you invest in healthcare. And everywhere in this world, even poor countries, if you're wealthy, you live longer. 
class determines, class is the ultimate determinant of quality and length of life. Places that are lower, lower income countries tend to have a higher death rates from infectious diseases as their top 10 killers. Wealthier countries, it's chronic disease, it's not infectious disease. The one exception for the United States, at least in the, in the, in the high income country is lower respiratory infections. That's influenza usually, or COPD, but that's usually, that's not COPD, that's it, usually that's influenza or severe bronchitis or severe pneumonia. And that tends to be in older people. And places that are less developed, uh, these are the big killers, AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, diarrhea in children, ch childbirth for women. These are classic patients that present themselves at Partners in Health with advanced AIDS and tuberculosis, thinking that they're not probably gonna make it. And what's, what's so rewarding and gratifying for working in global health is that we have drugs for these things. And that the key is just, the key is to get all these things that we have in surplus. Many of these things we have at the Student Health Center, get them through this bottleneck and get them to places around the world where they are needed. Rwanda, you can click on this as a great um, example of a country that has devoted its limited resources so successfully and efficiently towards public health that it's probably one of the all time success stories in, in improving life expectancy and in overall public health and lowering maternal mortality and, and covering everybody with basic health insurance. It's, it's, it's inspiring. If you want to find the opposite, you find a place that's going in the opposite direction. Um, Venezuela is an example of what can happen when all of a sudden the bottom falls out and there's no economic resources and there's nothing to pay for basic public health, healthcare, and medicine. All of a sudden things you've taken for granted are not available and just the opposite of Rwanda. Life expectancy starts plummeting and maternal mortality starts exploding and it's a truly horrifying situation. And this is even before COVID-19 will hit there and cause even more damage. Yeah, Venezuela is a real cautionary tale. So if you took a whole semester on global health, you would sort of cover all of these sides of the diamond in extended detail. Um, but for the purposes of this class, family planning contraception is an access to, uh, to, 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 um, to birth control is so critical to, to improving maternal health and lowering maternal more, uh, lowering both maternal mortality and infant mortality. So you wanna find places that have lower infant mortality rates. Well, those are places where they have, they, women have control over the, how many children they have and they have fewer children. So you wanna lower infant mortality and everybody does. One of the key ways to lowering infant mortality is to get control over uh, fertility and lowering the number of childbirths because they all pose risk and you want women want to have control over how many children they have and when they have them. And when you give that to women, when you provide that, you also bonus lower infant mortality rates. You lower maternal mortality rates. And once you lower, once you lower fertility rates, that's when your country can get wealthier. When you have fewer children and you can fully educate them and launch them and invest in them with human capital, that's when countries prosper. When women have seven, eight, nine, ten children per woman, and they're poor, well, those children are likely to be poor as well. And the Philippines is a good example of the importance of fertility control, because it's a very profoundly Catholic country which, which limits access to family planning, and it has the hospital with the most number of births per day of any place on the planet, which if you ever get a chance to spend time in a place of that magnitude, that many numbers of children, it's not a happy scene because what you see are a lot of people who are overwhelmed. Now in the Philippines, the good news, oddly enough, is uh, the president, Duterte, who is out of a movie in terms of thuggery and brutal dictatorship, doesn't agree with the priests in the Catholic church that women shouldn't have access to family planning. He believes just the opposite. And this is one of the interesting ironies in global health is that some of the most unsavory political leaders are the biggest supporters of public health. And it leaves people like myself, who's a political scientist and a public health person conflicted because you don't really normally instinctively support dictators and tyrants. Um, but some of these people are really good on public health. So ugh, how do you reconcile that? Again, you wanna get control of fertility rates. It's in everybody's interest. In doing so, you lower maternal mortality rates and you lower infant mortality rates, and life is better when you don't have children born into poverty. So are things, things getting better or are things getting worse? This is always a great question to address whenever you are dealing with 
his, the history of public health that shows a lot of progress and then crises like COVID-19 and that gets all the attention you think, oh my God, we're descending and human life is getting worse and worse. Two things are, are true simultaneously. Things have never been better ever in human existence in terms of lowered poverty rates and increased life expectancy. So things are the best they've ever been and things are bad simultaneously. simultaneously. And that's actually probably always been true. But right now is the best we've ever had in terms of health statistics, even with the crisis of COVID-19 and, and other diseases that we've always had to contend with. They're, they're both true. And it's hard for our mind to, to reconcile that, but you know, it's true. It's fewer children die now than have ever died per capita. And infant mortality rates are lower than they've ever been everywhere. Right? And fertility rates are lower now than they've ever been, which is good because then you can manage the number of children you have. Do we still have real problems? Yes. But proportionally and historically, they're the lowest we've ever been. And so, you know, one of the ways that you can really invest in public health is through this concept of positive deviance that I'll actually speak more about next week in our last class. But positive deviance in a nutshell is about finding solutions organically in the place that needs the solution. So not coming with an expert from some other part of the world to come in to solve child malnutrition or, uh, or fertility. It's finding homegrown solutions. And there are multiple examples of positive, deviant, organic uh, solutions to problems. Michai Viravidia in Thailand is known as the condom king. And he basically solved two crises. By destigmatizing condoms and promoting family planning and contraception, he, he, he allowed Thailand to escape the poverty trap that had bedeviled it for so many years, decades, by bringing down the fertility rate in one generation from about six or seven children per woman to about two to three, by extolling, among other things, condoms. And, it, and that, you know, that, that was the solution for Thailand. It worked. He's Thai. He understands the language, the culture, the religion. And so when he promotes it versus some NGO that comes from outside, it has a much better chance of working because he knows Thailand. He knows the people. He knows how to make this work. So if you click on this, if you want to see the story, it's really inspiring. And maybe the most, the biggest NGO example of success of all time, and the one that is maybe the most um, desirable to emulate by any public health and global health NGO is in Bangladesh, in the Bangladesh Rural Advancement Committee. Bangladesh is still a poor country, but its health statistics and its health performance is excellent and far better than its economics would, would predict because of this organization, BRAC. And just click on, if it isn't click on this, I'll put the link in, or just Google BRAC um, and RX for Survival documentary series. Because BRAC is an NGO that is driven by women who work in the villages, who are sustained by microfinance, and they distribute medicines, they do diagnoses, basic diagnoses of infectious diseases like tuberculosis and cholera. They, uh, in years past, spread the news about how to do oral rehydration therapy to treat diarrhea. And BRAC is just one of the ultimate examples of a self-funded, self-financed NGO that harnesses the power of science, business, and women to improve public health in a way that no other NGO ever could. So click on this and you'll see how this all plays out. Thank you very much. I'll see you all next week for our, uh, another class on positive deviance and we'll pick up the story then. Take care. You have stopped screen share.